And once again, I want to say greetings to each and every one of you. Aquaba and welcome, welcome, welcome to another round of culturally conscious communications here on LIB Radio, LIBLiving.com. My name is Kidi Awadu, aka the Conscious Rasa, the brother from the future. Weekday mornings, you and I get together live from 9 a.m. Pacific Time, 12 noon Eastern Time, 5 p.m. GMT, and 8, 7 p.m., I should say, East Africa Time. We get together to deal with a broad spectrum of activities related to human development. And today's date is Wednesday, the 22nd day of June 2022 in the Western calendar, 6262 in the Kemetic calendar to which we realign our cultural clock. Welcome to the seventh millennium. You found your family in a peaceful place here on LIB Radio, LIB TV, and livinginblack.com. Today on LIB Radio, we are honored to have one of our favorite guests return to us. He is the proprietor of the Africa for the Africans Tourism and Investment Group. He has brought hundreds of people to the motherland over the previous two decades as well. And a number of these people have repatriated to the African continent. That's a proud moment. So get your questions answered by someone who very well knows what Africa has to offer her diaspora seeds. Without any further delay, let me bring in my guest today, Brother Bomani Tayimba Akwaba. Welcome, Brother Bomani. How is a lion doing today? Let me get my headset on so I can actually hear you talk. Yes, All brother. right, uh, Greens family, this is Bomani Tayimba, and I'm always happy here to be connected with my good brother, uh, Kidi Awadu. You know, we kind of built a modern day energy of people wanting to be interested in Africa tourism investment and definitely want to talk more about that. Absolutely, beyond a shadow of a doubt, Africa for the Africans, tourism and investment group, I call it. Is that, the, is that a pretty good description of what it's all about? Oh, yes, absolutely. Africa for the Africans, tourism and investment, uh, general spectrum. So we can talk about the many different uh, countries we do tourism. And then the, the focal point of investment is to build that uh, Black Star Pan-African community uh, as a foundation piece to where we can just use as a model to be able to live and do business efficiently there in Ghana and to be able to just go back and forth to where we have the, the infrastructure and the organization that we have to expand our Africa tours and then expand our community investment, also get into industrial development and things like that. So this um, it's a nice broad spectrum to really just build an energy from 2006 to now and even before that, the, the years of just studying as a student in 2004, just going around different countries and learning and recording and uploading information online or just videos. For those who remember the videotapes and DVDs and, and those era. Mm-hmm. That's right. I want to first build a contrast. You and I are working diligently to point people towards the African continent to solve problems, key problems. You live in Atlanta, a city with a lot of black people, one of the largest concentrations of black people of a major city in this country. I think Atlanta would be called the capital of the South. <laughs> and Atlanta is a city of multiple contrasts, diversity. On one hand, if you are committed to pan-Africanism and black nationalism, black independence and progress, you can find a lot of people sympathetic to those ideas to interface with and develop with right there in Atlanta. But on the other hand, like so many other cities with large numbers of African-Americans, African people in America, in them, Atlantans, from my perspective, the majority of blacks in these cities don't really have a notion or care about Africa. Nowadays, when I hear about blacks in Georgia, blacks in Atlanta, in the media, it's most often talking about Democratic Party politics and trying to get a particular politician into office. My question to you really centers around, is the current trajectory of Black people in America problematic? Is it moving us into a grave, historical, dangerous position? 
a problematic, I would say, um, yes, on one of the main terms of the problematic situation is the fact that uh, uh, we're not creating enough opportunities for our own uh, children. And uh, are we going to leave them at the faith to beg for opportunities of all the other nations of people who are struggling to find opportunities for their own people and also looking to enterprise as world power? And so that's uh, one <laughs> aspect of things. So when we're talking about uh, Africa tourism investment, it's literally just to open up our minds to see what about uh, us relocating some of our population of people and creating uh, opportunities uh, from communities to, uh, you know, we talk about factories, we talk about this, and both residential and commercial opportunities to where we can live, do business efficiently, and also make our move on African continent without uh, wearing out the infrastructure that's already there. Uh, so, you know, so we talk about the importance of rural development. Uh, so looking at one aspect of things that could be a problem or us being a problem here and then using the African connection as a solution because now you're creating opportunities for your children that you're bringing and also creating opportunities for the people that you're connecting with in that specific country. Uh, so that's just a quick analysis of that. So I'm not sure if I, uh, if that was where you were aiming at. Well, no, I, that's, that's exactly what I was looking at. We are providing avenues where solutions to long-term problems can be found. One of the worst long-term problems we've identified for black people in America is demographics. Our numbers, our concentration, the backing of our group by major structural organizations. Chinese people, Chinese businesses in America are backed ultimately by the power of Chinese investment groups and banks. Korean people have the largest uh, ethnic owned bank in America. Hispanic people, the largest Hispanic owned bank in America is something like eight times larger, maybe more than that. I think eight times larger or more. No, I think it's closer to 20 times larger than the largest black owned bank in America. Wow. So can we as black people in America even think to thrive if we don't connect with our global ethnicity the way that other successful groups are doing? And that's the advantage uh, that we uh, can have if we make it work. Uh, because mm -hmm. now we, we look at uh, what we have in America and then what we have in Africa. What we have in Africa is, you know, we have aspects of land that we can get involved in as far as uh, development. And then we have aspects of people here in America who would train skills and this, the need to, the know-how, I should say, as far as building, uh, you know, building cities, town, a country, uh, and things like that. We have people in all different phases of America. Uh, so that's what I'm, we're looking at, uh, connecting our strength in numbers and connecting us as a people to strengthen our future together. And it's the same thing when you talk about, you know, when you're talking about Korea or even uh, China, uh, they're, they're leading the path for those uh, situations, or even India. They're offsetting po their, their big population in their, in their uh, small country, and they're connecting them into places where they can, you know, have more of a global presence, and then they can... Uh, do business with each other more and compete. Uh, so we're seeing things, uh, and it's the same as you know, uh, Marcus Garvey um, talked about in Vision. You know, Marcus Garvey that we built our foundation on, as far as this connecting to Africa and and you know, doing our own you know, development. We have a call coming in. Um, usually, people do not call me at this time on this number. Let me just double check. Caller, are you trying to get through to the show? To you being responsible. Yeah, that's what I say. Spam. Oh, boy, this has been a spam filled morning in America. Unfortunate. Well, as we definitely talk about Africa for Africans is what Marcus Garvey talk about. Literally us doing the same thing as all other nations on the planet. If we want to compete and if we want to not just be dominated. And that is us connecting our population globally and us building the level of black economics to the highest level, which is this black ownership, owning the homes in your community, owning the infrastructure, owning aspects of just things that goes on in the town. Uh, no longer, you know, we need to be a people where we live in a high percentage of a population of a town. And then when we step out of uh, those residential area, everything in the commercial sectors is owned by everybody else. So those are the things that we can change with land and with development. So that's kind of the simple conversation that we, we keep as far as getting people to travel to Africa, seeing the beauty, understand the fact that they're dealing with development and, and not this 
in a dreamland to feel like they, we're going to Africa where the red carpet is going to be rolled out and everything is just there perfect and things like that. That's why I feel good about just trying to do as much as we can do, bringing a connection energy from America to different aspects of Africa and through tourism, which uh, creates and also boots economy, just trying to create some aspect of energy to where people are now open their minds to like, okay, now I'm in Africa. Now we have seen the beauty of Africa. Now, what are we going to do next? And it's kind of like that year 2019 of return, which is just mm-hmm. recently, but also even before that, in back in 2006 and seven uh, and eight, uh, nine, and those early years, you and I was on on the radio, and we had this incredible this energy of people, and pushing the word out got more and more people to actually travel to Africa, and more and more people actually to live and do business, mm-hmm. and that influence have carried on to you know, another generation of people. And yeah, to where now you see a younger generation of people doing it. So, you know, these are things that we can do, but it's like we need, you know, we need more of us to get together and do it. And more and more of us to understand that the ones of us that's in America, we know we can keep that that connection going. We don't, the whole population of people or sometimes people ask me how much percentage of our people may move to Africa. I was like maybe 0.1%. I mean, I don't know. It's going to be very small numbers, but let's just use the, the, the numbers that we have to work, but also understand that while we're in Africa, we got to find other ways where our people, our business there set up to where we can create opportunities on mm-hmm. the continent. So that community that we have in the business center and the community center, a lot of members that we have are going to be here and they're going to be using their resources to help make things work. Uh, and some showing people that, uh, showing people this is, these are some of the ways that we have figured out how we can make these things work. You know, we went above and beyond trying to make sure that our people get legal land to build on, to live in peace and things like that. But those are just foundations. You know, we need, you know, kind of, you need more people to back you up uh, so we can do it on another level. Because once we start getting ourselves more established in Africa, now we can start competing with the likes of like, the Indians, the Chinese, the Lebanese. Because when you're in Ghana and you look at all the development going, you know, you just have to just be honest with yourself and ask who's doing all these development? Is this really our people? How much are we really getting from the development of our own nations. Mm-hmm. Uh, did we did we invest enough in the development that's going on to where we feel like we should get returns and things like that? So these are questions uh, that we probably have this um, more and more questions on top of those questions than answers. But these are some of the things you can do because you literally have to find a way to make it work in Africa. And we that's have right. more than enough. So that's when the diplomatic energy comes to where now you're connected with your own people and you have to learn your own people culture and your own people have to learn your culture. And we have to build some level of understanding to where we can figure it out together. Because at the end of the day, if it doesn't work, who are we really going to blame? You know, we can blame the near colonial colonialists and we could blame the original colonizers and we can blame everyone else. But at the same time, too, we have to take a level of this. You know, a level of accountability that this is our responsibility. So I'm always reaching out to the folks, the Africans in the diaspora that's from the different countries in Africa that are living well in America and ones of us from the Caribbean islands and and, and, and just us in general and saying, hey, family, this is our responsibility. This is our prized position, our continent. Let's make more moves to strengthen our continent. So that's what we're doing practically and just trying to just share it in theory and science as much as possible for people to see the, the the importance of us just doing this and so why we would love to have more and more people to travel to more and more African countries as that beautiful fly that uh, you you shared uh, on the um, on the thumbnail mm-hmm. uh, an incredible schedule of like 15 months of traveling across six That's African right. countries on seven different schedule uh, and the good thing about it is only one country that I've not been to which, which is Liberia the rest of the countries I've been to times and times over so mm-hmm. One let people know that we got their back and they're ready to to take the journey of a lifetime across Africa because right now all this mass mandate is dropped, COVID tests, things are dropped. So it's a little more simpler now to go back to traveling now. It's going back to the good days like 2019 and before. Mm-hmm. And while airline prices are high right now, oh, wow. the <laughs> thing is, is when you land in Africa, the U.S. dollar is heavy. And it, it weighed against currencies around the world. The U.S. dollar is heavy across Africa, which means if you invest your dollars in Africa, it's going to get a lot more return on investment. Um, unfortunately, Bomani, 
a lot of our people in this country have just been tricked. They've been had. They've been misled. They've been bad bamboozled. They've been hoodwinked into thinking their only avenue toward building wealth is investing in America and what America deems to be wealth. You got people out here right now, Brother Vomani, as crazy as it sounds, saying this is a good time to invest in, in Bitcoin. <laughs> That's I'm not going to be insulting to people because they just don't know any better. They don't know what intrinsic value means. They don't they just don't know. But to invest in something that has dumped what more than it's dumped more than two thirds of its value just this year alone to oh, say wow. this is a good time to invest in a sinking Titanic is to me just an indicator of part of the biggest problem we have here is the miseducation, the hoodwinking, the bamboozling. Some people still think Africa is a land of starving children and Tarzan in the jungle yodeling at the animals to come and kill the African king. In, in, in different manifestations. I know that's kind of a cruel thing to say, such as an entire mountain of gold was discovered in the Democratic Republic of the Congo last year. I believe it was the uh, Kisai province, you know, province. might have been a different province, but I think that was where, either that or Kavu province. This year, Uganda has identified gold ore that will produce when refined a total of $12.1 trillion worth of gold. Do you know how many African Americans first reaction to those or, well, here comes the white man to steal it all from us? <laughs> That's Tarzan in the jungle, isn't it? Yes, it is. Uh, yes, it is. Um, you know, we should say, hey, uh, what are we going to do to to make it work and uh, for us to get a piece of uh, that, you know, that gold mine? We, if we want a piece of the gold mine, we should have started working towards it when the people who do have a piece of those gold mines did. They invested in the gold franchises or gold digging licenses. People say, well, Africans need to develop nuclear weapons to defend that gold. Well, one of the franchise owners is China. So if someone comes and tries and steal China's gold <laughs> part of that investment, their outcome from that investment, China has nuclear weapons. The largest standing army in the world. So people talk like you've got some sense. And uh, I really want to go back to our point. What you and I are suggesting through this newly, not necessarily newly open doorway, because it's been open since the 18th, 19th century and uh, with the Liberian enterprise. But through this doorway of returning to our mother continent and building it up with our labor and our creativity, we open the door not just to survival, but I'm talking about a wealth on this planet that has never been seen from any single empire that should last for 1,000 years or more. Brother Bomani, your thoughts? Yes, and us building an empire. That can last 1,000 years. Uh, yes, and that's, uh, that's the goal of us, um, making sure that we don't leave our children with nothing, um, making sure that we build a strong foundation to where you know, it can be built upon and built upon from generation to generation. Uh, so that can definitely happen, family. Uh, we just got to figure out if we're willing to put the work in, because right now, you know, you have this race to Africa. We, you have all these nations, and then, you know, we're like dead last, and I'm not sure what uh, we're really enterprising in on a stronghold in Africa. I'm not saying that we're not doing much, but... It's still the, the usual suspect, uh, uh, all of the uh, foreigners. Uh, and when we do find our people there that are doing, they're doing wonderfully. Yes, and we do have to work more with them and, uh, you know, put aside all the egos and all the other stuff, you know, that goes on uh, with us uh, saying, hey, let's make our enterprises uh, twice as strong as a foreigner enterprise. That way they mm -hmm. don't run out of business because, you know, that's what goes on. So that's the, the challenge that we have to face. And. Once we get past that roadblock, and not saying a smooth sailing, but you know we're able to build on a little stronger. But uh, we're just being outcompeted. So, mm -hmm. uh, and this crabs in a barrel mentality, so, as it's called here. Then instead of collaborating, cooperating, we just grab each other, pull each other down. This yes, crabs yes. in a barrel mentality is one of those cultural values that have been absorbed by our people during this Maafa journey. That if we 
are not careful, we can drag crabs in a barrel mentality to with us wherever we migrate to, whether it be the Caribbean, Central America, South America, or to the African continent. Crabs in a barrel is still going to be crabs in a barrel, and you cannot and will not compete successfully dragging that cultural chaos along with you. Would you agree? Uh, absolutely. So enough of us have to work together efficiently to be strong, to where even the crabs in the barrel and the haters or whatever we want to call them won't uh, stop us from doing what we're doing. So uh, that's what I'm always telling my, my group of uh, people that I'm building with. Uh, we just got to just uh, build our strength in numbers and then find other people with the same vision and just build with them and then just keep it going like that because uh, the aspect of what we just talked about is always going to be there and you know it, they should be your motivator you know, and make it excited and make it competitive. Uh, but uh, too many of us, uh, you know, get discouraged because when we're trying to do certain things, we see this, you know, bad energy out there. But I'm mm -hmm. always telling people out there and just trying to encourage those out there, like family. It's uh, it's what it is, and just let it be your motivation. And um, always look to connect with good people who got your back, so you know you can do this together stronger. But uh, uh, but you know it's it's a good time right now, uh, especially since the world has opened up and um, a little simpler to where people can travel. Uh, but the, the game has to expand from beyond just America, beyond just too much of our focus being on how we can build a beautiful, better black America and, and get into the game of this uh, global uh, enterprise and then uh, domination and competition. So that's what we're doing here at Africa for the Africans, uh, Black South Pan-African community. And the most important aspects of uh, doing all these things I talk about is getting land. So mm -hmm. that's, that's why we have acquired and paid in full for 15 acres of land on our phase one uh, operation where people are building their homes and we're gonna build an incredible business and community center. Uh, the business center, that's your social aspects of connection. Excuse me, the community center, your social aspect of connection and the business center is your enterprising aspect of what we build in uh, to where we can do our daily business and work efficiently where we have the space and all the rooms we need to this, do the things we wanna do from a technology operation to our Africa tour operation to uh, building more for real estate development and learning how to do uh, you, know, b you know big projects little by little. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's the world that we live in where now you know you're looking at North Africa and you're seeing all of these brand new cities that's being built outside of the de you know, in the middle of the desert, mm -hmm. and, and that's some serious engineering feat and seriousness, uh, you know. Uh, having organized construction to be able to do those things. Uh, so you're, you're seeing a world where we have to get our children into in, into these uh, different fields, more into business technology. Mm -hmm. So that's what, you know, your business center is there for. That's what we're getting additional land so you can get back to planting or you know, organic food. And you're getting to, to where, you, you know, you're building the things that you need, you know, from your, your maintenance building, your medical mm -hmm. building, and so on. So that's what the Black Star Pan African community represent, but that's also what getting land represents. You, know, mm -hmm. you can build the things that you need to wear now. You're not so much, you're not so much, um, you know, you're more of a producer versus just everything in your whole town, you know, is being produced by other people and you're just consuming <laughs> and doing a lot of productions. It's like, you would never build or, or, or establish both that way. So that's what we're looking at, uh, and the more importance of land, but land is also very tricky in Africa. You've seen so many videos of this, land chaos and land drama, especially in the popular countries like you know, Ghana uh, mm -hmm. and, and Gambia, where more of us are moving. But I tell people that just because these things are the way they are, don't mean that they just keep being this way. Uh, I know for sure in Ghana, the, the, they're always working on making sure the land and everything works. But I'm telling people, if they look back even 15 years before this, a lot of these systems and things weren't in place. That's to, right. Uh, and our presence there is helping to push the implementation of these systems good that point. combat the corruption good point you know even now you have you know you have non-ghana card like i have a non-ghana card now once you get to the you know, ghana you show your passport uh the identification place and now you have a card where you can do things at your bank and you can do things to where the country kind of kind of uh, kind of monitored to a point uh the, the energy of people coming in from you know from the other countries you know the diaspora uh, whether they're african diaspora whether it's uh you know foreigners or expat and things like that so mm -hmm. i'm just pointing out a few things that you know that's been that you see things are being put in place to run more of an organized country and you know in order for these things to happen you know 
the different countries in Africa need our support and things like that. And you know, even the 2019 year return, that has been the, the influx of and connection of us have changed certain things and the way the country is looking. The country is trying to develop themselves more serious to, to gain more interest and more investments. Uh, so mm -hmm. we're doing good family. So that's why we want to get more and more people on all these wonderful journeys, whether you travel with us or travel with other people. We want you to see you in Africa, spend your black dollars in black in black countries with black people and black business. That's right. That's right. You had mentioned a couple of times the 2019 Year of Return Project. Well, it seems too often African-Americans are getting excited about 1619. Instead of the Year of Liberation and Return, America and America's media keeps putting emphasis on your arrival here enslaved. And even then, that whole 16, um, 16, 19 project is a deception because black people had arrived over 50 years earlier in Florida, which was not a U.S. state, but the colonies were not U.S. states at that same time as well. So, you know, we're being led around by the nose from one deception to another deception. And what you and I are saying, here's what I'm saying. And I'm going to challenge anyone listening today, and I'm going to acknowledge the people who are in the house, who are commenting. Here's a challenge. Ask one question that you don't think being a functioning Pan-African aligned with our people around the country, around the world, that you don't think being a Pan-African development, that Pan-African development won't solve. I am saying virtually every problem we've identified as being a terrible problem among African-Americans going this pathway that Bomani and I are pointing to, Africa for the Africans, those at home and those abroad, that is the pathway of our wholesale redemption. Not just surviving, I'm talking about thriving on the highest level. Why should white guys and Chinese have all the fun for the Romani? Go. Let me acknowledge the people who are listening today. Um, uh, let me just go through the list. I see you, Juan, checking in. Peace and blessings. Daudi, Brother Daudi Mahali, checking in from a Kosambo region. You know, he was one of those people who made his first trip to the African continent with what group, Brother Bomani? Yes, family, with Africa for the Africans family. That was October of 2007. And uh, that was our second time to Ghana, and that was one of our biggest group, 42 Kidi, and you spearhead that energy. Uh, when well, I did, I did the best I could. We <laughs> did it all together. That was a beautiful, beautiful time in our lives, and, and I just great. had the most enjoyable time doing it. And Brother Dawoodi, you know, I don't know whether you know his whole backstory, but Brother Dawoodi lived in the Bay Area, and according to the medical establishment, he was being told to be prepared to die. Well, Brother Dawood, he's still going strong now. Absolutely. Living on the African continent for many years. And I heard rumors that he's even out there helping our demographics out a little bit. Absolutely. Really? You know, it's all about nation building. That's yep. all about nation building. So, Stephen, Mother Earth. <laughs> Brother Dawoodi, we salute you. He says, greetings to Kiti, Brother Bomani, yes, saying sir, hello Dawoodi. and respect. And Dawoodi was one of our first people that literally moved to Ghana. And, and he's I gotten his citizenship now. Yes, and, and that's when we were literally just building what we are building, but that was our first person to move, family. That's uh, right. So family, just want to let people know that we've been around for over a decade and a half, and we have built this modern-day energy, and we're taking it to a whole different level now. It's going to a whole new level. It's all beginning brand new every season. Um, a couple more people. Henry is in the house, sends his greetings to Bumani and the global family. Terrence in the house, greetings, Bumani. I will see you in a few weeks, brother. Hopefully he'll be seeing you on foreign shores where he might just be heading, heading to your neighborhood. Um, BW in the house. Hi, brother Bumani and guests. This is Sister Akuvi, still here in beautiful Ghana, still reporting Ghana. in. Sister Akuvi, she yeah. was one of the ones who traveled with you? Uh, yes, yeah, Sister Akuvi was on our Ghana May 2020 to journey of a lifetime and she stayed back along with a few of us but uh she's still there enjoying it that's how much uh she enjoyed the journey so i'm telling people you can come on these wonderful journeys and if you it's only for nine ten day on all of the schedules so if you want to stay longer we extend your ticket you stay longer you travel around the country go to other countries like we have another person she's on our way to tanzania 
you know so it's uh it's incredible but yeah okay. that's our kuvi i uh, must love to your sister kuvi and uh, we have our sister joanne on our way to uh tanzania so that's another this incredible way family expand your connection uh mm -hmm. you know all you have to do is connect with us and we'll get you there that's right that's right couple of, of tactical questions from henry does travel to any of these countries require both visa and passport in order to get a visa doesn't that require visiting the embassy in washington dc great questions it got good answers for uh yes as far as the countries that i have on our schedule uh four of those countries require visa and the visa process is something i have on email and i have on our website where we just go through it and you fill out the paperwork whether it's online or whether it's uh physical and then send it in uh so example tanzania uh, visa requirement is all online. Uh, mm -hmm. So you literally upload information from your passport, your passport style photos, and you fill in all of the uh, online uh, information and also pay online. And you get a visa literally sent to you via email. Mm -hmm. now, Ghana, the Gambia, and Liberia, the other countries that need a uh, visa, you'd have to fill out the details and mail in your passport with the package. And then you get a visa stamp in it. And then they'll, they'll send it back to you mm -hmm. and, uh, and it's a basic process but all of them are going through some form of em embassy whether it's uh, online or whether you have to send it in and the pr process is uh, simple for all of them it takes anywhere from uh, five to ten days and uh, tanzania being the one that takes the simplest anywhere from two to three days you can get your visa back mm -hmm. and in countries like yeah. tanzania have visa on arrival uh, but not all countries have visa on arrival but the best thing i always recommend before you travel is to get all of your visas in the US. Uh, that way you can get the max amount of length of uh, visitation in the country. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and it's you do have to implement the process two weeks before, a minimum of two weeks before you expect to depart. Again, 10 business days, because many of these embassies and consulates or many of these embassies are not going to be functioning over the weekend. So don't mess around with that. It could be a little problematic if you get to the airport and you don't have all of that up to date. Oh, yes, um, I think so. People, the best thing to do is just do it about two months before and let's get all these things done. And a month before you travel, everything is completed and you just be more prepared for your journey. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I do see Rhonda in the house, Rhonda Cooper, Uja family. Did Rhonda go with us on one of those trips to Ghana? I'm thinking I remember her. She lives there in yes. Osa, or Atlanta as well. I'm trying to remember. Um... Yeah, her beaming, smiling face. No, I met her on their trip to Jamaica. That was with Brother Unk on our Living Superfood trip. But um, yeah, Rhonda, you definitely do if you haven't already want to hook up with Africa for the Africans.org. Kashiba, what is your call in number? The studio number, I have them streaming at the bottom of the browser right now. You can call us on the studio number at 323-328-1863. Call. And you can also call us at 646-716-9835. Okay, so those are the call-in numbers. I just typed in one of the two there just now. She said, my friend had a question. I believe that friend was Brother Henry. We did get those questions in. And Maverick in the house, if Afri Amers are relocating to these African countries, is there any form of gentrification happening over there? <laughs> a whole lot. It's not gentrification. It, it, it is land acquisition. And the way they are acquiring, it's not like they're getting block after mm -hmm. block and putting in a Whole Foods and a pet grooming place to replace us. Over there, we're talking about what happened in Madagascar a decade or so ago where the Daewoo Corporation of South Korea attempted to lease the, something like 32,000 acres at $12 an acre for a 99-year lease. Fortunately, the government the, the government was thrown out and they reversed that deal, but they renegotiated another deal. The Saudis are coming. Everyone's coming to Africa to get large swaths of land. We're not talking about block by block gentrification. We're talking about large lots of land. Now, we 
have a group, Brother Bomani, and you have a group as well that's acquiring and developing land. Our group, Africa, is called the African Future. We have um, up to 135 acres now. We're developing for okay. agriculture in Uganda. Your group is also developing a large acreage as well in Ghana. Am I correct? Uh, yes, uh, 15 and 60 acres, a total of 75 acres. Yeah. So it's not gentrification as we know it. It is competition for <laughs> land. We have to understand Africa is huge. Brother Bomani, is that true? Africa is huge as you're flying over. You look down, you look out your airplane window, and all you see is green, 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 and it goes on for hundreds of miles and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of miles. Uh, land everywhere. And like I was saying about North Africa uh, or Northeast Africa, they're building cities out of desert. So, That's right. And That's then, right. Yeah, yeah, so all aspects of the, the continent can be developed. And uh, the part That's that we're right. talking about is more of the tropical part, you know, East Africa, West Africa. Southern Africa, uh, Central Africa, but it's, uh, you know, you're talking about a big continent. Mm -hmm. Now, when you're talking about gentrification, here's where gentrification becomes an advantage because largely the gentrified properties are being bought up. So if you are an African American living in the DMV or Baltimore or Atlanta or one of these other places where this phenomenon is taking place, let's say you have a house that has how much equity would one have in a house there in Atlanta, Brother Bomani, if the house is paid off? I don't know, maybe a quarter million dollars. If you have a quarter of a million dollars that you can bring out as cash and take to Ghana, what would you be able to do with a quarter of a million dollars living in the metropolitan Accra region or Kumasi or one of these cities? Uh, you can do a little something, but uh, you, your best bet is to go out more rural. Get go to 35, 40, 50 kilometers out of the city. Uh, about a good hour or so. Mm -hmm. and, uh, start some um, residential development um, for apartments and uh, rentals and uh, commercial development as far as shop stores, uh, a warehouse, uh, maybe a few factories and uh, to where you can provide a uh, different level of services. And that's an investment into creating opportunities, number one, uh, for people there. And also to where, you know, you're making something where it's profitable to where you can reinvest later on. Uh, so that's just one idea of it. Or you can use all that money and get you a nice quarter million dollars house in East Lagoon, And then you just live happily in your house. And there's no or get there. you a bed and breakfast and have everyone else pay for your, li your <laughs> lifestyle. So there you go, family. Uh, a bunch of different ideas on what you can do. Now, um, in Nairobi. In Nairobi, I was just in Nairobi again for my second time. You've been to Nairobi, am I correct? Uh, Kenya once. Uh, that was back in uh, 2005. Lovely, lovely. I fell in love with Nairobi. In Nairobi, the big thing right now is they are building these huge apartment buildings everywhere. And uh, people are just buying these apartment buildings for relatively cheap. You can still get them at forty to $60,000 for a two-bedroom, two-bath apartment. I'm you sure know, in a few years that'll be uh, it'll double in value, and that's so it's, it's already happening. But what they're doing is they're buying them, renting them out on Airbnb, and with just four days of occupancy per month, you're paying for the building while it's building equity and it's doubling in value in your real estate profile. You got young people in their twenties and early thirties buying up these apartments and Airbnbing them out. There you go, family. Uh, those are all great ideas of uh, what you can do, uh, but, but you know, but that's when you, that's why you have to just open your, your minds to this traveling, journey the continent, and then these opportunities are going to pop up right in front of you. That's and right. Even, even right now, we're telling you these things without you having to even travel. But you know, in order to get in, into the game, you know, you know, you have to also travel to the country and that's right. Find out what's going on, and you know, get a feel of everything, and get get the right person to help you uh, to you know make some of these deals and decisions. Mm -hmm. People frequently ask, well, what's the best country that I would move to? My answer is, is which is the of, of the ones you visited, which is your favorite? Because <laughs> there's no one point. size fits all. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, I have friends that's in the, the Gambia that works for them. And, I have, you know, we're in Ghana and you know that works for us. But I'm also looking to you know connect it to the Gambia, Liberia. 
but you're limited on, on on how many countries you can go to. But you know, it's enough uh, information online. I mean, for mm-hmm. people who want to come to countries like Ghana, and it's you know, there's lots of information that we have. You know, whether it's showing you every single aspects of the country, uh, as far as just the day to day, how the streets look, uh, restaurants, you're moving around, tourism sites, historical sites, socializing with uh, you know with people, uh, you know, visiting different businesses and things. Uh, so you, you know you can get a get get a feel uh, that way, but ultimately you know people, everyone literally just have to mark down the countries that you just that draw interest to you and go and then, you know, and and mm-hmm. visit. There's no wrong country. I feel like you can go to, especially when you pick uh, the countries that you have researched and you find certain connections with it, uh, and you know that's how simple as you know I look at it and you know I started from one country to the next. And I started from Senegal. Went to uh, Egypt, uh, then went to South Africa, went to Kenya, then went to uh, the Gambia, and then the sixth country went to Ghana, the seventh country Togo, eighth country um, uh, Benin, uh, ninth mm-hmm. country um, uh, Ethiopia, and the tenth country uh, Tanzania. And the country mm-hmm. number six and number ten is my favorite. Tanzania. Uh, yes, the two countries and uh, those are my two best schedules that I have also. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I do. De- I've I've never not yet been to Tanzania, but I expect to on my next trip to East Africa. Yeah. I think you've you've heard my backstory. <laughs> I'm in love with the East African community, all of them. Rwanda, Burundi. I've ne- never been to Rwanda or Burundi. I know Burundi is still a bit of a mess, a bit chaotic. But Rwanda is considered to be the Singapore of Africa. I've fallen in love with Uganda. I'm still featured on Uganda's national television network from time to time. And um, that's a big honor. I mean, ABC, CBS, NBC, not even NPR will call me. I have 43 books now, you know, and they won't even call me. (laughs) So, but Africa, we do mean something. And the universities, if you are a scholar or an educator, the universities and all levels of academia will welcome us with open arms. Isn't that true? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, higher level of education, you're welcome into these institutes. And that's uh, and, and uh, when I started uh, going to Ghana, I realized that a lot of professors th- that was moving there, you know, they would work for the University of Ghana. This is a- <coughs> You know, give a few years and then they'll move on to other things. Mm-hmm. Um, there's always a connection, and you know, it's a good thing because you know, we're, we're, we're really trying to build in uh, different international countries. You're going to definitely need intellects from many different places. Uh, so that was, uh, and then you know, also, you know, for those of us from the uh, you know, from the African diaspora, from the Americas, you know, we want people to be more familiar with us and. Uh, aspect of this history and struggle needs to be told also because that's one of the things that's lacking on African continent. Um, you don't find a high level of people with, that knows a lot about us as a people and our struggle. They may know certain basic things based on movies and shows they're seeing. Uh, so that's also, also a great way for us to connect and mm-hmm. foreign exchange information. Yeah, so so very important that we would do that. I see some more comments and questions have come in. The phone line is open, 323-328-1863. Call in. We'd love to hear your voice. Ask a question directly of Brother Bomani, and uh, hopefully we will inform, inspire, and excite everyone listening to get a piece of this pathway, this future that we are declaring Africa for the Africans, those at home and those abroad. I have a caller coming in, area code 310. Who you is, where you at, what you want? Hey, my name is uh, Juma Rafiki out here in Los Angeles. Hey, brother Juma Rafiki, you know a little something, something about Africa for the Africans. Yes, I do. Um, My first travel with Bomani in 2019 to Ghana and is, you know, it just opened up a whole new world uh, to me, and I was so happy to go um, uh, with him. Um, and I'm scheduled to go with uh, him again to East Africa in uh, November. Absolutely. Appreciate you, uh, Juma. We get- okay. hey, a second, Bumani. I just got to get him so he can hear you speaking. Okay. Um, uh, Brother Bumani, you're responding to Juma? Yes, good evening, uh, Brother Juma. I oh, appreciate you. Appreciate your journey with us in um, May of 2019 for that incredible year of return. 
and then also that's coming back with us in 2021 uh, for Senegal and the Gambia. Now, my first actual Senegal and the Gambia trip that worked because I've been trying to do a real tour there and they've always gotten canceled. So appreciate you joining that one, brother. That was a great uh, energy. And then now we're doing- Yeah, he's a little faded. I can't really hear him. Okay, um, let's try this again. Um, I've got this setup over here. StreamYard doesn't allow me to plug in my um, hybrid telephone directly. So it has to come through the speaker one more time. Um, continue, Brother Bomani. Uh, yes, I was just saying, Brother, appreciate you traveling to those uh, wonderful countries with us, Ghana, Senegal, and the Gambia. And then now you're ready to go to Tanzania. And I also appreciate you just pushing the energy out there, letting people know that this is a life-changing uh, journey and you have experienced it twice already. And uh, this is something that you're recommending for your brothers and sisters. So I'm just looking forward to more people coming, connecting with us, man. We're definitely looking forward to connecting with you again, brother, uh, so we can just enjoy another incredible journey. Great memories. All right, Brother Juma, a follow-up comment or question? Uh, you know, I, I didn't really get much oh, of that, but I, listen, you know I something really called in because I wanted to encourage uh, the LIB radio family to look at Bomani's website, Africa for the Africans, check out all the details and, and everything that are listed on the website and make up your mind to just take that one trip. Uh, I was a little bit fearful at first, um, just like any, uh, like a lot of people who have, um, who had uh, never taken a trip to Africa, but you know, I wouldn't trade that experience for anything else in the world. And I encourage all of our family out there to be able to look him up and travel with him. All right. And my apology to you, Juma, that you couldn't hear him. Uh, there was one more button I needed to push when literally when someone calls in, I got to like push like four or five buttons to get them to be able to hear each other. But, um, you know, you know what Bumani, you know that he greatly appreciates your presence and your informing other people as to your experience. Isn't that true, Brother Bumani? Oh, yes, absolutely, man. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, one of those businesses that, uh, you know, you're not going to be able to develop unless you have people who are really just dedicated and want to actually see Africa and want to actually just you know, go on a program to where, you know, you know it's all us, you know, all us. You know, Black African people just you know, enjoying an experience, and you just need everybody just to be on good energy terms, and you know, and that's our good brother here, Juma. So looking forward to more people like him joining uh, these wonderful journeys, and and we can just uh, build from there because it's also it's boosting the African uh, you know economy. That's one of the, the big things about it that you know we should all feel proud about ourselves because we you know we here we are we're supporting a black owned business, and that black owned business is supporting other black owned business. You know, so we're showing our money, you know, we can just move our money and also just you know, get it to where our people are showing us a good time and we're enjoying wonderful countries and wonderful experience. And also these relationships that we build, some people go on to do many different things on their own, uh, whether it's uh, building a family or building enterprises, you know how that goes. All right, Brother Juma, final question. Who is Africa for? For Africans. Africa for the Africans. <laughs> those at home and those abroad. Thank you, Brother Juma, for calling in today. We appreciate it. Love you. Thank I you, Brother. Peace. Respect. All right. Phone lines are open in case anybody else wants to give us a call at area code 323-328-1863. A um, couple more comments. Rhonda, no, I haven't been to Ghana yet. You know, Rhonda, with your big, beautiful, beaming smile and the beautiful eyes. You better take your behind to Ghana as soon as you possibly can. The thing is, Bomani, people like Rhonda and Daudi and so many others, you keep sending them to Africa, but you don't always bring them back permanently. Absolutely. No, more and more people are moving, brother. More and more people are, are also, once they get to Ghana, they're researching other countries. So you have people in Rwanda, Tanzania, mm -hmm. uh, Gambia, Senegal, uh, South Africa. And, and they're uh, moving they're, there. They're moving they're there moving permanently. And, and the only I, thing I'm encouraging more of is this, uh, you know, black corporate <laughs> economic investment. People mm -hmm. make their money together because, you know, we, we can't compete in the, uh, as individuals anymore. It's just it's not getting us too far. So don't do the same mistake we were making in America, in Africa. Mm -hmm. Here's a great question. I think you'll like this one. Brother Alpha Grill asks, 
Have there been any engagements and or marriages between African Amers and Africans from the <laughs> continent as a result of these trips, Brother Bomani? Always, it's been a whole bunch of nation building. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Let me tell you, know. you, that is not at all hard to do. Contrary to, environment. To, yeah, contrary to what a lot of people believe, Africans don't like African Americans. They love us, Brother Bomani. <laughs> they love us. And I'm not going to tell her myself. <laughs> yeah, I'm just gonna I, leave I, can, I, I can only generalize. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to tell her myself, but I will say that in some of those photographs that I took on my Ghana trips, you might notice some absolutely stunningly beautiful people close to some of us on the trip. That's all I'm going to say. If, yeah. the, for, if you're a sister and you like men, go to Africa. If you're man and you like sisters, go to Africa. Absolutely. If you I mean, are a brother who likes blisters, stay in Atlanta. <laughs> you know, because the most important thing I'm going to talk about the African continent is the incredible population of single black men and single black women. I mean, this is the youngest part of the planet. When I, go to, when I go to Kenya, I'm almost always the senior citizen in wherever situation I find myself. I'm like almost always the oldest person or one of the oldest persons in the circle. And even then, look at me. I'm a young old elder. <laughs> I'm a young elder. And so they really, really do admire it. So Alpha Grio, single man that you are, <clears throat> get your airplane ticket together. Get your passport together. Get your visa together. Get on the website, africaforthafricans.org. Pick one of those trips. Close your eyes and point if you have to. It's going to be that kind of an experience. Brother Bomani, uh, I do plan on visiting Senegal later this year. One of my dear friends is celebrating his 10th anniversary over there. And he's um, big in media and communications across the continent. So I told him I'd be there to help him commemorate that 10 year anniversary of relocating to Ghana, as well as I have to put Tanzania on my travel schedule as soon as possible. I want to visit all of the East African community countries before they complete their federation into a new nation, which is expected to take place between 2025 and 2027. Af Bomani, a brand new nation happening in Africa. And by 2050, it's expected that ECOWAS would have followed so that the economic community of West African states will be a federation, SADAC, as well as the Central African states, of course, Congo, which was the biggest economic potential of the Central African community of states, has joined the East African community, which is incredible, too, because the East African community, when configured, will be the fifth largest population in the world. And it will be the it will be the fourth largest population in the world, and it will be one of the wealthiest nations natural resource wise in the world with huge demographics and natural resources. The future's unlimited, isn't it? Absolutely, family. Uh, there's no limitation. We just got to get in the game and build up from there. But uh, first, we have to get in the game because most of us are not even in the game. We're just spectators. That's right. And we can do better than that. We can do better than that. Anybody got any questions? Ask a tough question to Brother Bomani or myself. If you are skeptical about all of this, if you think we're just pipe dreaming some ganja smoking Pan-Africans, ain't nothing wrong with being Pan-African. Ain't nothing wrong with smoking ganja, unless you don't smoke it anymore. <laughs> if you think that we're just making this stuff up, ask us the toughest question and ask us to validate our answer we know what we're talking about brother bomani you are an ict technician i have been an ict technician and a scientist for most of my life and we just don't just be saying stuff without being able to validate and prove it and verify it and um one thing i tell everyone is um the life I talk about is the life I've lived. Uh, everything that we're, we're about, that we're doing, is based on experience. Let me just ask the question of our audience. Would you 
you marry an a continental African and build a future family there. What about you, Brother Bomani? Would you marry a continental African and build a future family there? Unless you're married already. Absolutely. Um, you know, it's all about nation building. So, you know, you, you build one there in Ghana and, and or another country and you build one in America. You know, if you want to defeat, you know, you know, there's no limitations. But uh, not, yes, uh, absolutely. Especially you're not talking about having three or four wives now. <laughs> I didn't say that. I was just saying that uh, <laughs> people don't have it. There's no limitation based on what you can handle. Uh, but uh, absolutely on the African continent and uh, and things like that. But uh, definitely, you know, I want to see more of us, uh, you know, like we talk about nation building and enterprising. I want to see more of us do those things and you know, keep uh, the black economy strong, black families, black, you know. Mm -hmm. um, Rhonda asked a question. Is it true? that Ghana requires a COVID vaccination card in order to enter the country. Now, a lot of things have, a lot of things have changed uh, from the end of uh, December last year and the beginning of uh, this year. So on our return, coming back from Ghana, uh, a lot of those things changed. Mm -hmm. now, as far as entering Ghana, uh, what's quote unquote uh, requirement, for those who have a vaccination card, you don't have to take a COVID test. Uh, and then if you don't have the vaccination card, you have to get a COVID test. Uh, and you have to do that even to get on the airlines that leave the U.S.? Uh, yes, to get on airlines. And then once you get to the country, you have to either show your vaccination certificate or your COVID-19 certificate. So mm -hmm. that's uh, as simple as it is now because a whole lot of other mandates have been dropped. And then on your return, uh, we didn't have to show a COVID uh, vaccination card and we didn't have to take a COVID test. So and then we didn't have to wear a mask, even more important, because... I've had two straight years from 2020 to 2021 and all of the the, uh, the six journeys that I did in those two uh, years and literally had to wear a mask on the entire flight. Unless you're eating, which the <laughs> yes. germs, the germs that... pause when they see people eating. <laughs> <laughs> it just shows you how uh, absurd well, I guess it uh, acceptance of this thing had become it really became quite absurd didn't it I and mean, i mean that was two years of milking it milking something that could have been for six months but nevertheless i tell people that sometimes you have to stay around long enough to survive it so i'm telling people that we've been doing these africa tours non-stop i mean i did two in 2020 that's right that's Tanzania right and ghana and then did all four of our full schedule in 2021 minimum that's numbers right. though and you know and it's what it is but one of the show mm -hmm. that you know we have to continue to keep it going and the connection that we made in Africa that we built, we spent so many years building, we can't just let it go for you know, right. whether it's Ebola or whether it's uh, you know, the COVID-19 uh, uh, era. So we've survived both of those, uh, Kidi. We've survived mm -hmm. the world financial crisis and we're still in business. Uh, but uh, th this coronavirus has wiped out a lot of people out of business uh, from, mm -hmm. you know, from uh, tourism and transportation to this many other sectors of business. But uh, we're here strong and we didn't people know that we're fighters because we want to make sure that uh, that's my little boy passing by. He's not going to want to come say hi. Son, you want to come say hello? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's, um, yeah. he's enjoying the summer. As a matter of fact, he had his 12th birthday party at One Africa Resort in Elmina. Years old that was awesome. So I, I haven't put those footage up yet, but he was there. And you know, it's, I mean, literally on his day of his birth, uh, June 8th, uh, mm -hmm. 2022, he was uh, literally born, uh, you know, so... That was good. It was born in 2010, so the 12th, the 10th straight year from traveling to Africa with us. That's uh, beautiful. Started in, in, <coughs> started in 2012, actually, mm -hmm. years old, and then continuous all the way to that time. So 10 years experience. So all of his young friends that are with children came out to this, uh, you know, show him love and everything. It was incredible. Mm -hmm. and, oh, that is really beautiful. And um, children are one of the hallmarks of these travels to Africa. You know, as much as we love our child or maybe two child per household here, when you get to Africa, there's a whole lot of babies to fall in love with. Isn't that true? Uh, yes, absolutely. And that's why we, wherever, whatever country we go to, always make sure that uh, we at least uh, show some level of dedication to at least one or two 
schools or orphanage and uh, in our case in ghana we have up to sometimes three to four mm-hmm. and uh, we just bring as much supplies and show as much love and then you have also people that that stay back and they sponsor children and they do other things and then you know then whoever see videos sometimes reach out to schools and and do things with them and connect so, but i'm telling people that it's just that simple you know you make an initial move to connect mm-hmm. them and you know even though we have our own situations here going on in america that's the only way we're going to make it work we have to connect to each other's culture and connect mm-hmm. each other's vision and make it work together you know that's all we have is us as a people and it's about time we just you know we strengthen our connection here's a great question from alpha grio what single african nation do you see rising within the next 10 years that nobody is presently talking about that's I would a say great question. I would say Liberia. Mm-hmm. That's a good one. That's a good you know, one. Brothers, um, you know, we've been doing some, they've been working with me over the years for, for us to just do tourism in Liberia. And I tell them that, you know, based on the schedule that we have, we have to just work towards that. And now mm-hmm. a few years later, we've been able to put together our incredible Liberia uh, itinerary. And we're staying at that uh, Kandasia Resort, uh, Bob Johnson uh, uh, Hotel Resort. And it's right there on the beach. Uh, and mm-hmm. that's uh, and also just creating it to where we're flying on Air of Morocco. So trying to give everyone a, a nice black African itinerary and connect back into the original OAU uh, where, you know, locations of where, you know, where our ancestors convened. Uh, some of them are still living. And since mm-hmm. it's literally just built what is today, um, which is known as the AU, um, you know, African Union. But we literally just going back in time and also visiting parts of Liberia where people never heard and seen. And things like that and also just sharing with people just the rich investment as far as land investment uh and also just trying to work with uh, you know people in the government to where we can create an opportunity to where those who want to come to liberia can be a liberia citizen without any form of uh certain criteria that people use now uh, some people using dna but uh, also looking to get a, a, a natural connection based on this our That's historical right. struggle and things like that and also what we're looking to do in the country more important which is to be a part of the future but that's yes, the man. one country i'm putting out there to people that's like i remember back in the days when we we're doing ghana and we we're telling people about ghana and, mm-hmm. well you know? there was a lot to talk about in ghana in 2007 2007 i spoke at a conference on the anniversary of the 50th um the anniversary of independence of unia sponsored a conference in accra i was with there with um our brother um Yao Davis, as well yes, as Davis, yes. Dr. Julius Garvey was on the panel as well. And I laid out the evidence that said that Ghana and Equatorial Guinea at that time had the fastest growing economies in the world. Right. And around that time, do you remember when the Ghanaian nationally issued bonds, government bonds were bringing in interest rates of over 25%? As As I over 180 days? From, from 2009 that's absolutely. right absolutely it and it a- didn't it didn't last forever but a number of people did get in on that oh did open bank accounts traveling with africa for the africans and did get some some of those investments in and that, that, that's one of those early energy that we know we started connecting with people on like, when you get to the country get your offshore account and invest in some stock bonds or treasury bills uh and things like that and you know, and get things going little by little, and then look at this as a country that's going to develop, and you're going to put yourself in a position where you can do more in the country. Mm-hmm. And the whole time we're, we're talking about and doing this stuff, you know, you have Dahoudi setting up his operation to live in Ghana, mm-hmm. and, you know, and he's been living in Ghana for peacefully for the last 14, 15 straight years. So I'm that's telling right. people that our program work, we're trendsetters, we're visionaries, and now I'm talking about a country, the country itself, Liberia, that original settlement from 1822 mm-hmm. to now 2022, 200 year settlement. Yeah, Liberia has tremendous potential in agriculture, in human capital, a lot of young people there. Plus mm-hmm. Liberia is really emerging from the destruction. And if we look at the example of where did Rwanda go to, where has Rwanda gone to after the decimation of 1994? Well, Rwanda is now considered the cleanest and safest country on the African continent. And if you look at before and after pictures of downtown Rwanda, oh my God, it's an absolute miracle. If I were to answer Alpha Grill's question, what single African nation 
rising that no one's talking about, for me, it would be Mozambique. Okay. And a lot of people have ignored the Luophone nations. They're <laughs> concentrating on the Anglophone, speaking English, the oh, because Francophone. Okay, gotcha. But the Luophone, the Portuguese speaking nations, include Angola, Cape Verde Islands, um, Guinea Bissau, as well as Mozambique. Yeah, and course. Mozambique is kind of hot, even though it's cooled a little bit because there have been some foreign sponsored terrorist activities that have been going on there. But that is pretty much under suppression. What I'm hearing from people um, more directly is that that's kind of overplayed in the Western media because they still want to promote the idea that Africa is unsafe place to make your investment. And family, and that's definitely not uh, not true. Because if uh, Africa was unsafe, you wouldn't see the, the all of the multinational corporations in the world. Some of the biggest corporations in the, that exist in the entire history of the world, they're all there in Africa. And then they're trying the to get in even nations more. in the world, like 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 China, India. They have representation from all over the continent. That's and right. They're import, export, trades. They're getting into different sectors of business that we don't even think about, and things like that. So. Uh, as quick as thing I can tell people, if, uh, if Africa was all this other stuff, then you know you wouldn't see the level of you have generations of Indians and Lebanese that living beautifully on the African continent uh, for generations. I'm talking about three, four generations, the same as uh, you know in in Jamaica. Mm -hmm. and, uh, they make it work, and they make it work on one base. It's this their their cooperative economic power, and them just understanding and being on code on how they move as a people and. And what they got to do to make you know to be dominant versus this you know in the situation we are you know in where we literally are just consumers everybody else come and build up structures and set things up and we're the first ones to this you know consume so that's what we talk about family we you know we, we're moving in the age of uh you know production efficiency and mm -hmm. uh, putting things in place to where we can just thrive as a people because the world has changed and everything is more global now and the last right. frontier or final frontier is still the African continent. That's where your incredible land mass is available for development. Uh, so when people are thinking and complaining about roads and electricity going on and that stuff, I was like, it is either you become a part of the solution or you sit around until everyone else develop it and put it together. And then and gentrify you out. <laughs> and then the only thing that you're going to be doing and your children are going to be doing is working in their factories and their corporations as modern unless, slaves. Unless you don't have any children then your children won't be working in the factories. You will be the end of your family's lineage, which is unfortunately, Brother Bomani, according to my forecast in the book, Fade to Black, that's the fate of African-Americans 43 years from now. The lack of childbirth, the birth dearth, will have committed us to being in museum pieces, just like the great Iroquois nation who named the state Ohio, where I grew up, you go there in Ohio now and say, where are those people who named this great state, this great land? You must go to the museum. That is where you will find the Iroquois people. That is the fate of African-Americans. Unless I don't think that the, the blisters in Atlanta are going to turn around our collapse in fertility. <laughs> no, I, I, I doubt it. So that's why you have strong men like myself out there ready to you know, get, you know, handle business. And that's why we're in Africa. Mm hmm. There's a uh, comment here, a couple of comments, Alfred Grio. I have ancestors from Liberia that were from that there. Supposedly, they were crew ethnically. And Juan says, my DNA came back 94 percent Mozambique, 6 percent Portuguese, Spanish. Looking forward to going there. Excellent. Let me ask you this, Brother Mana. You're a scientist. What do you think about these DNA ancestry tests? You know, I try not to not the hustle on things because I know everything also is a business. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but I've never taken one and uh, a few people have offered me uh, options of it. Uh, I think the issue that I have is going to be with the result. You know, it could be anything. And but at the same time, too, uh, you know, I have the countries that I've already confirmed that I want to work with and I'm not looking to add any much uh, more. And, mm -hmm. and then it's not going to be based on if I have a DNA there, it's going to be based on what I can realistically get established and set up there based on the things that the country is offering and things like that. But that's just how I'm looking at it. No knock to anybody else. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. You also have to use the different ways to get people interested in Africa. Like right now, yeah. there's a big push right now in Sierra Leone where, you know, where people are literally just connecting their Sierra Leone DNA to citizenship. I thought that mm-hmm. was a great program. You know, and any way you can kind of work it and get people interested. But the only thing is, you know, when we get more and more people coming to the different countries, we want them to be more in the mindset of being there to this, be a part of the future of the country, uh, you know, creating families, creating industries, you know, building for the future. And that's mm-hmm. what everybody should do. It, but, you know, we also, that has to be a focal point of it. And, you know, because too much other times our people, our people here in America, they have no interest in Africa. And all they ask you about is questions about dual citizenship. Mm-hmm. You know? And, and they have no interest and they want citizenship. <laughs> no, don't even have a pass, don't even have an American passport. Uh-huh. And yeah, that's yeah. The they're they're, 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 they're not, not even in the game. Even like that. You have to, you know, you talk about countries that are, are working their way to development. They need you to be a part of something more than that's coming in and get what you feel like you can get from the country and leave. That's right. That's right. That's absolutely true. We can do more for Africa than expect Africa to re- reciprocate and do more for us by giving us a sense of identity. You know, I have been highly critical of these DNA ancestry tests for a long, long time, many years. I have a background in, you know, molecular science and biology, too. So I, I had some for, some insights. And here, let me just make this real simple. You have two parents, mother or father. Your mother had two parents, a mother, father, four grandparents you have in total. All four of your grandparents contributed to the essence of who you are. Am I correct? Uh, yes. And when you go to their grandparents, you're now talking about four times four, that's 16. All 16 of those contributed to your essence. When we go back 20 generations to the beginning of the transatlantic slave trade, that takes us up to 1,048,000 ancestors would have contributed to the essence of who we are. So therefore, the DNA test can only find two of those, one matrilineal line, in one patrilineal line. So now with the DNA test, you might at best find two people amidst that 1,048,000. So the the question is, is you know, the, the reality is, is I am connected to all of those so-called ethnic groups or tribal groups. If you're talking about a million people and most all of us came from the Western African regions and not so much from places like Mozambique or the central part of the continent, we have to understand I am Igbo, I am uh, Tree or uh, Ashante, I am Ga, we are Fante, we are all of these, we are an amalgamation of all of them, we are truly the Pan-African body, and unfortunately even the Euros stepped in and raped a lot of our mothers and great-great-grandmothers and also put that thing in there. And these ancestry tests, if we're not careful, will take you to Europe. You got some people out here, black as I am, blacker than me, black as you, brother Bomani, full and thick and rich in you, in your um, skin melanin, epidural melanin, who brag about their European ancestry. Oh, I'm part Scottish. Oh, I'm part Irish. Are you serious? They're bragging about stuff like that. Wow, so it must be really serious. That's the Stockholm syndrome going overdrive. So can we do better than that? Definitely. And we must, family. We must do better. We got to do better than that. So supposedly I have ancestry from the crew in Liberia. I visited Liberia years ago. Most of the people welcomed me and called me brother. Isn't that true? That happens again and again wherever you know, every we country go. I've been, if you bring the right spirit, uh, as long as you come with the right energy, you get number love in Africa. I'm mean, just being honest with people, straight up. Nothing you know, but love and things like that. That's one of the things you're gonna definitely get greeted with. So I'm telling people, don't waste your time going to Europe. Go to Africa because you're gonna get, you know, you're gonna get, a, you know, you have a connection. Uh, you know, as far as Europe, the only thing you're gonna be doing there doing is spending a bunch of euros. That's it. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> You're not getting nothing else accomplished. And you can make it's been a bunch of euros. And quite often, hearing what their local word for the N word is as you turn to walk away. <laughs> I've been to the UK enough times to know 
they do not like us. Yeah, that's uh, one of my uh, one of my least favorite places that I've ever traveled to on the planet. It's like on the bottom of the list. Yeah, you know, Heathrow. I've been there five, <laughs> and some people that may say, "Well, the white people going back." I was like, "No, I have family there, but I draw the line one year." I was like, "I remember coming back to this place. This place. You wake up sometimes, brother. You wake up sometimes at three o'clock in the afternoon, and you don't know if it's three o'clock in the morning or another time of the day." You cannot figure it out. Canopies of, of clouds blocking out the sun. Huh? Like literally, the sun does not shine. You can just tell there, there's been a history of this wickedness that goes on to the place. The sun does, does not shine. <laughs> and <laughs> while we're bagging on the UK, <laughs> I get on people. It's like, why don't you open up your curtains and let some light in your house, in your room? <laughs> you know, I live in Las Vegas. And in, in Las Vegas, <laughs> it's like there's windows all around. You know, we got a lot of heat out here, but one thing we do is fill our houses up with daylight. I mean, and when I wake up in the UK and those curtains are drawn like that, like you say, you don't know what time of day it is. People walking around 11 o'clock in the morning with all the house lights on inside. So, so I also tell people to appreciate what we have in Africa because what we have is, you know, we have a world of this beautiful uh, rain and dry season. We have a, you know, incredible climates and we just have everything that we need as a people. To, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, we just got to build up our economies, and that's that's, that's right. honestly it. I mean, uh, could the, Africa the, use some more and higher quality indoor toilets? Uh, absolutely. I mean, you need you know, all the technology. You know, the, the that's thing technology. Of this, that's technology. That's developed. You just go. You just. You, that's why it's ideal to get land in rural areas and build smart cities or mm -hmm. build cities with um, modern technology to where you're not putting a strain on the actual national grid. You know, that's uh, right. You, whether you're tapping into the world of this, uh, you know, uh, solar power or w uh, wind power, or just whether you just you, you find out a way, different ways how to harvest water to where you're creating your own incredible water system, mm -hmm. where you don't have to worry about power or water going out, because that's one of the biggest issues that you have, uh, which is makes no sense because you have more sunlight and you have more water raining in Africa than anywhere else. Mm -hmm. So like, some people that you know all we have to do now, since we have more modern day technology and use. The ancient version of this technology and just use it in a modern way because you know because right. it's like what did our ancestors do i'm sure they just didn't suffer no they, and they didn't bitterly complain about having to do the things you got to do every day and i will say this much about the toilet of all of the days that have been in africa maybe 15 days at a time in ghana with africa for the africans or so I can only recall maybe one or two days when the toilet made me feel so uncomfortable I didn't want to participate. <laughs> I don't like squatters, even though after using a squatter for two days, you're used to it and you realize it's a more natural body position. It's just that, you know, you got to take, be sure to take your phone out of your pocket before you get to. <laughs> uh, I know, I know he's talking about now. When we're traveling around in different countries, um, from country to country, uh, and you go to a gas station, that's more like what you see, especially in the out, out area. And, mm -hmm. you know, I remember literally going from Senegal to the Gambia and back. And uh, yeah, so that's when I see squatters. But uh, for the most part, when you're in the cities that we're driving around in, uh, you, you know, we get you to good places. Yeah, and you nice, <laughs> comfortable bathrooms that, you know, that are just, just lovely. They're well tiled, they're cleaned, and, yeah. you know, the toilets work real well. I mean, it's beautiful. You get used to Africa. It's not that difficult at all to get used to. And the food, the food there can be spectacular or it can be like, you know, well, what do you guys eat? What do vegetarians and vegans eat in Nairobi? <laughs> I've been to Nairobi now two times. And on this last trip, I really struggled for the first five days or so to find me some decent food. It got to the point where I would go to restaurants and I would send special instructions to the chef. Here's what I want. One restaurant even went down to the market to buy some broccoli and cauliflower and the things that I wanted to eat. They went and bought it and they prepared a meal for me that was so spectacular. I said, tell the chef to come on out here. Let me thank them in person. The chef asked me if he could use this recipe in the future. And I said, absolutely. Anything, oh, wow. any that. recipe I help you with, please use it in the future. Claim it as your own. It's only going to help the people who come in to dine at your fine establishment. And for doing all of that, the restaurant gave me a wonderful reward. And I'm not even going to mention her right now. Uh, they, uh, they gave you, the, uh, they made a, 
Where well, they made this spectacular meal for me, but also, you know, give it, give it the, hostess, the hostess was was the, the mostest. <laughs> Absolutely, that, that's what's up. Congratulations. That's right. That's right. So, Africa for the Africans. Those at home and those abroad. I was speaking about some Africans from abroad. We went to the beautiful West African nation of Benin to the the roots of the Dahomey Empire, and when we got there. You brought us all to support a school called Ecologia. Yes, you absolutely. recall that one? Absolutely. I'll never remember forget that. It was a couple from Guadeloupe in the French Caribbean had decided to relocate to Africa. They were welcomed there. And do you recall some of the details about their school, that little village that they were building? Uh, the only thing I really remember is that the government gave them more land and they have a, they had a nice agriculture program that they were expanding on. But that was uh, literally in 2009. And uh, I went back in uh, 2017, eight years later, and, you know, everyone is all grown and they're still doing good work there. And literally just, you know, making it work by just getting more into uh, sustainable uh, uh, living, you know, creating their own ecosystem to run their school. That's right. As I recall... They had built the school out of their own pockets and taken in a number of the children from the local village. And the government was so impressed with what they were doing. The government had granted them a four hectare grant of land to expand upon four hectares. A hectare is two point. I think it's two point four seven acres, if I'm correct in remembering that. So that was like nearly nine acres, about nine acres of land the government donated them. They built this little village, these beautiful huts, even built a playground out of natural local materials. They were growing mushrooms there. They were strictly vegan. And do you recall they had all these little avenues in their little miniature village named after Harriet Tubman and Marcus Garvey and Emilcar Cabral and these great ancestors? So just before you and I arrived there, the government was so impressed with what they had done with that donation that I think they had just granted them another 200 hectares of land. Is that true? That we did visit? Uh, that was our, that's correct. Uh, that's the additional land that they have that they're developing. And I was saying that they're making um, their own ecosystem and get into more agricultural development. And that's love, isn't it? That's just, that's love coming from us in the, in the beginning from the diaspora. But they showed the love, the love of reciprocated. They took that love to the next level and the government came back and says, hey, you need a lot more land to for us to show you how much we love you being in our country. That's what we can do there, brother. And it's, and it's that simple family. Uh, you know, you you have to you have to make you know make a make a connection, and, and somebody has to start first. And a lot of times you're right. looking at the what about African countries? Why aren't they coming to do this? And you know, you do have many different countries in Africa send representation all over America and all over other parts of the diaspora uh, in small units to do wonderful things. And mm -hmm. uh, you know, and you know, us as a people have to, you know, you know, do do more by this us coming in numbers and visiting and making that yeah. reconnection and just getting to know each other as a people. And then from there, anything can happen. I mean, uh, just like you and I was, uh, just like you and I was communicating on text and we're communicating about go black. And I was uh, mentioning uh, to you that uh, the energy of what we have built as far as us working together to promote Africa tourism investment, it is connected with so many people. And our brother went with us to to Ghana in November of 2018, and then now he's uh, you know been doing his research over the years and going to so many different countries. And now mm -hmm. he's here online and he's giving people a different perspective as far as critical things in Africa and how we mm -hmm. can connect and you know get to the content and do certain things. And you know, and then you have you know other people that have you know traveled with us and that influence have connected them, and now they're do, doing wonderful things. So just Appreciate the fact that you know we can take people to Africa, and once we get them there, their mind is changed to where now they're doing incredible things. Just like how we talk about Dahudi, literally being the first person to actually <clears throat> moved, moved completely and lived there mm -hmm. uh, on the African continent, and has been and has been there as long as we've been doing almost tours. Uh, so then people know that uh, the the program works. Uh, it's just uh, we're trying to get more and more people into that program to where we can just have different uh, results and different people be inspired mm -hmm. by different things to actually go on and do the work that you know, maybe they are meant to be. Uh, so, and everyone that I've, that I've connected to Africa for the most part, they're, 
it, it just it's it just one of those days one of those things where they've been looking to do looking to travel to africa for years and then they connected with the right group and then you know and that's it and i'm telling people it's literally that simple like uh brother juma got on a little while ago and talked about his mm-hmm. group. you know you know you're a little bit you know you you know, you never made this move before, so you, you know you you know you have thoughts going through your mind. But I'm telling people, all they got to do is just connect with us, and we'll make it as easy and simple as possible. Everything is already put together, and you know when you're in the different countries with us, we have people around you making sure that they have your best interests and looking out for you, so you're protected and you're good. Mm-hmm. So, then the brother from Go Black to Africa, um, the, how do you pronounce his name? Is it Yi or Yai? No, it's uh, Ni. Uh, Ni Ni. Yeah, brother Nico. me. Um, that brother is just brilliant, just genius. Did he make his first trip to the continent with you? Uh, yes, uh, November 2018 uh, and things like that. 2018. I was so thinking they, he had said 2008, which would uh, have had so me so there. On the interview talking about uh, the, that connection and things like that. And what you know, a, just what a that he's inspired, and I just appreciate him. I uh, appreciate mm-hmm. anyone that we have this connected with that's doing anything in Africa. And it's, and, it's, and, and a lot of them are not on YouTube. That's the only thing. Uh, mm-hmm. But I'm inspired and connected with a lot of people. I mean, I brought over 500 people to Ghana. So you can imagine wow. maybe 50 people decided to do certain things. And, you know, the program that we always have is a program dealing with the repatriation and investment conference. And we're always dealing with some level of land investment. Now, mm-hmm. we deal with Black Star Pan-African community where I take them to our own land. That We have the whole, the whole connection and set up to make it work smooth for them. But before we were just trying to connect people to different land and different mm-hmm. projects. So I'm telling people that um, you know, I just want to see more people get in and connect in and let's do this together stronger. So I'm That's helping right. them with a group to he's doing a group to Ghana in November. And, and so all the people that we have there that are good people, been able mm-hmm. to connect with just like anyone else that call me and say they want to do certain things. Because the goal of our operation is to to help people get to Africa. So whether they That's come right. through us or whether we can work with some other groups of people. So, so they can get their network of people connected. Because uh, mm-hmm. I've helped several people even start their business in tourism and they've been bringing their groups to Ghana and things like that. And it's been, and they'll tell you that I'll do 100% out of love and things mm-hmm. like that. But, right. I, you, you have to look at the long term of it. So somebody may say they're in the same business that you're in. I'm like, and what? We have a big population of people that we're trying to get to the continent. And I don't want to be putting too much pressure on myself. And I got other countries that I want to do. Like I'm telling you about the future, what I see Africa is like countries like Liberia, and I want to tap more into that, mm-hmm. but also at the same time to connect people to countries like Ghana that has it going on to where they can, and if they want to do things like land investment, they have good people now that we have uh, that we can just get things done because that's the hardest thing about the different countries trying to get things done. And when you learn a formula of how to get things done, and when you have good people that you're working with, you know, you, you just keep the, you know, keep the formula going to where you can get the things done. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and we've been able to get this a whole lot done the last three years, even with the coronavirus, because we have the land and we're building on it. And so mm-hmm. and it, uh, things yeah. are as possible. And very, uh, very important. And, 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 and drama. <laughs> there are so many trips and they have been going on for some time. And they're go- they are so popular for good reason of, of our people traveling to Egypt to see the glories of ancient Kemet the Nile Valley civilization, and to reconnect with our great, great, great ancestral roots. That's a good thing. My first trip to Africa was to um, the Nile Valley, and I had a wonderful time. It changed my life forever. But the next year, I made my first trip to Black Africa, to West Africa, to (laughs) Ghana, and it's never never gone back. I've never, I want to go back to Egypt, but I would rather go back to Egypt and take family members that have never been there, say a wife and children. I would like to take them to Egypt and have them have that eye-opening thing. But you know something on these trips to Egypt, they really are not promoting business investment and land development. Why would you not want to go to the Arab Republic of Egypt, which is what they call themselves, the Arab Republic of Egypt, and tell our people we need to start building our homes and businesses there. Uh, me, uh, <laughs> uh, this, uh, that's not my uh, connection. I like, you know, I'm from Jamaica. I love the tropical energy. I want to be by beaches. I want to uh, push us building our own resorts, us learning to get out there, build boats to where we can go out there and just enjoy uh, 
the, the world of the, the, the ocean and you know, get into um, the import, export and transport and, uh, you know, goods uh, from you know, one country to the next, like from Ghana to Gambia. You know, so that's where that, that town that we're in is close to Winneba. That same Winneba we went in 2007 where we love the beauty of the water and love the beauty of that town. And, and so uh, not really, you know, so I'm not you know, really into the mindset of this, um, trying to compete with uh, the, the Arab Republic for anything, you know, it's um, mm -hmm. the situation. And if you are, you're gonna have to just bring it strong. Uh, but, but that's one thing I don't see, I don't see much of us doing enterprises anywhere in North Africa or Northeast Africa or anywhere no, like, especially across the five or Africa or Southern Africa, especially across the northern part, which calls itself the Maghreb, the Arab Maghreb. Now, I say they're not so much Arabic as they are Mediterranean, but okay. that's you know an archaeological dispute <laughs> there. Of all of these countries of northern part of Africa, it was Libya that was proving itself to be the most pan African and see a pan-African future, and then look at what the Mediterranean, what the European, the NATO people did to Libya. They shattered it. They destroyed it because Muammar Gaddafi had made his commitment to build pan-Africanism and the African Union up to its full potential. And I've never seen any type of commitment like that come out of Egypt since the days of Abdul Ghano Nassar. I think I mispronounced the name. Gamal Abdul Nassar, he was a pan-African, stood alongside of Sekou Toure, Kwame Nkrumah, uh, Julius Nrere, and many others t advocating for pan-African unity after independence. So there are these dynamics, many, many dynamics to it, some of them political, some of them economic, some of them just pure love we could just reduce it to that term love it's about building together working together investing together marrying together having babies together celebrating those babies educating those babies providing health care for the babies and their mothers and the community and the family and elders what about elders moving to africa to retire brother Mame, bumani have you ever seen any advantage in that Oh yes, it's a hundred percent advantage. Uh, definitely, absolutely. <laughs> the most important one is going to be your health and wellness. Uh, example: If you are out there in the town that we're building, our community, uh, our Black South Pan African community in Jahadzi, out there by Winneba, you're right there by a nice, nice, nice beach environment. So you can just enjoy this relaxation. Uh, you're there in nature to where you can enjoy your coconut water, your mangoes, or your tropical fruits. You can walk into, you can walk around a tropical environment. Uh, you're not restricted by the cold climate. Not saying that you can't walk outside when it's cold, and you know, but you know, to have your t a shirt on and your your and your shorts and this, uh, your your walking shoes and being able to mm -hmm. enjoy nature almost all year round, uh, definitely ideal. Now I've got my t-shirt on today. Yes, absolutely, family. Yeah, that uh, wonderful journey. That's uh, right, journey of a lifetime. Uh, People see all these different colors, especially when we're just doing new videos and things. And I tell people just years and years of those shirts and that energy. That's um, right. And that another great advantage for those who would retire in Africa, for one, if you're on a fixed income and you're having to pay rent in America, it's getting worse every year and it's only going to continue to get yeah, worse. It's fixed income. The money's not really going up much, even doing no. that. But $2,000 a month, for one person or two people each in one household, that's going to have you living in luxury. Yeah, if you're, you're living in Africa, Africa with a, you know, with a, you know, with a husband and wife, two thousand dollars a month, especially if you are building your own home, because mm -hmm. after a while, then you won't have no utility bills, and uh, you can have live-in housekeepers. No mortgages. That's the advantage right there. Yeah, no, you know, when they do build a house, they build what's called the boys' quarters which is your on-site security, or you can have your maid or your cook and your housekeeper living there at your house as well. And their daily wages are very, very reasonable. And they got a nice place to stay with people who love them dearly. I mean, there's just so, so many advantages. The climate there, you're not having to battle snow drifts and being shut in during winter. You're not having to battle with Anthony Fauci 
<laughs> trying to take your mojo from you. <laughs> so many advantages. I would definitely retire. I'm not planning on retiring. I'm going to be working the past 100 years, Brother Bumani. But I would definitely, if I were a retiree from a traditional job in America, I would definitely take my retirement income and my home equity and go to a place like Winneba. And I remember standing there on the property of the Rock Top Beach Hotel, That's it right looking there. down across this beautiful little meandering stream that came out to greet the ocean and look down towards um, the, the south or eastern part of the beach. And for as far as your eyes could go, you saw nothing but palm trees, no dwellings, no high rises, no hotels. Brother Bomani, that was one of the most romantic sights I've ever seen. I always dreamed about going there and buying that property right next to the Rock Top Beach Hotel. Is the hotel still in place now? Uh, yes, it's still in place. It's being used as like a, from a, you know student dorms to uh, rentals and things like that. You know, because you just have to find a way to make it work. Uh, mm -hmm. You can't run it as a quote unquote hotel operation. And it's just a lack of clientele and lack of you know, marketing. A lot, of, a lot of these areas are areas that are developing to where it takes time to really build the, the customer base. Mm -hmm. in the so you have to just be flexible. Uh, so that's what I've learned in those even early years of us uh, seeing other people with established business and things like that. Yeah, that was just such a beautiful location. And when you told us, when they told us what they paid for the land there, and this was, of course, while Jerry Rawlings was yes. president of Ghana, was it something like five hundred dollars an acre? It was, something... it was basically uh, uh, cheap to nothing, just a yeah. very reasonable price to almost nothing. And that same land, if that were in California or Florida, which is the only parts of America that have, unless it was Hawaii, the only parts of America that have a climate like that right on the waterfront, if you paid for that type of land in Florida, Brother Bolani, could you get it for five hundred dollars yeah. an acre? You now might be able to stay overnight. You're going to be paying hundred thousands of dollars. Hundreds of millions of dollars. Oh, wow. Millions. Sorry. <laughs> Caller, we have you up. Area code 813. Do give us your name or where you're calling from. <coughs> Grand Rising Southern. This is your cousin Rashida calling you from Emporia, Virginia. <laughs> Greetings, cousin Rashida. Great to hear from you today. I hope you're in beautiful spirits. We're talking with uh, Bomani Tayembe. He is the founder of Africa for the Africans. You have a comment or question you want to share with us? Yes, I do. I've really been enjoying. Um, I was trying to just listen and actually do my business, but I had to stop my business to listen That's because right. this has really been awesome. Everything that you have been talking about. Mm -hmm. um, I've, I've been blowing up your chat. I don't know if you saw it. I've been blowing up your chat, but I want to contact you to make sure that you visit, that you visit my in-laws when you go to Senegal. They will be there for you. They might not let you know. <laughs> all right. But all right. I've been all right. to the Senegalese man for 31 years. And they love our family, and they are ready to meet us. They want us to get there and to see them. Have you um, entertained plans of visiting your family and spending time in Senegal? Um, well, you know, we have a large family. You know, we got these, you know, we got eleven children, mm -hmm. eleven full of children over here, mm -hmm. and we got to get these passports rolling. That's right. That's right. Well. I would encourage, even if just you, uh, if just two or three members of the family, four members of the family, get a chance to visit. It's just, it's such a life changing, life transforming. Um, Bumani, many of our people of African heritage, they know they're of African heritage, they acknowledge that and they appreciate that, but they've never had a chance many times to even be outside of America. Even going to Jamaica or, you know, another nation with a majority black population. Brother Bomani, doesn't that make a big, big difference on how we see ourselves in society and in the world? Absolutely. And that's why we're pushing this uh, energy as, as, as uh, Africa for Africans, you know, all black people around the African world, on the continent, outside the continent, uh, trying to build a connection with all of us uh, as a people. And so, and uh, show us in the light of just us, um, 
enterprise and us uh, having aspirations to the run our own affairs, uh, build black, you know, black economies, uh, support more black owned business, let's be more about ourselves, uh, teaching the rest of us about our own black cultures around the entire world and things like that, and just get into it, you know. I'm telling people it's uh, it's that uh, the 21st century is the century for us to be a part of the future, of building the Africa that's going to uh, stand the test of time. Uh, mm -hmm. And I'm like, sorry, I should have put this microphone in so she could hear you speak. My bad, my bad, Sister Rashida. Okay, continue, Brother Romani. Uh, yes. Yeah, so uh, the energy that uh, you know we're, we're building is just really just to encourage other people to participate, you know, realistically. And, uh, you know, we've been doing this for over a decade and a half and talking and repeating ourselves about a lot of different things and a lot of the trends and things that we talk about, um, what's, what's going to happen in Africa has, has been happening. And, uh, you know, we can only do so much by ourselves. You know, the, the, sm the small acreage of land that we have gotten, the 15 and the 60, you know, we're limited on what we could do with those uh, uh, land size. But if other people do the same and do the same in different countries, mm -hmm. now we're talking about um, us connecting as business entities or business enterprise, you know, which would be no different from all of the, the rich corporations in the world that's always doing business with each, each other just to keep the small mom and pop's business down and just uh, continue to dominate. But that's how I'm looking at it. I'm looking at it as, as a form of just, you know, and the best representation I can say is just Amos Wilson book, Blueprint for Black Power, just really just living that mm -hmm. life. Uh, so um, we, we're not only just talking about Africa tourism investment, we're living that life, like I walk and talk that life every day. And I'm here mm -hmm. in my office, uh, just making it work. I'm just here in Georgia and we have a whole bunch of movements in Africa going on and we're making it work. It's like, like some straight naval military, this uh, tactical operation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I would say this further for people who want to travel to Africa, but say they don't have the money. OPM. Other people's money. <laughs> Use other people's money. Find a way. Find a group, a tourism group like Africa for the Africans and help them to get to expand their list by 10, 20, 30 more people to travel together. Brother Bumani, that's how I got my trips over there with Africa for the Africans. I think the last trip I went, I paid for it, but I used money that... We raised money to buy an FM radio station to take yeah, over there and donate. And I just wrote myself into the plan because I needed to train the people. I was going to stay there an extra week to train the people to run the radio station, to put it together, assemble it, run it, and maintain it. And I just wrote my budget in for that training and then used that to pay for my trip. So OPM, other people's money. This is how we travel to Africa. We, you and I went to Ethiopia for an oh, awesome, that was great <laughs> trip. How much did you have to spend for that trip? I uh, didn't spend any money other than just basic spending. But uh, as far as the, uh, as far as the ticket, the accommodations and things like that, it was all covered. Because you had something that they needed and they wanted, and that, that true? Yeah, we were marketing. We were all working together to market Ethiopia. I thought we did great on it, but the issue is like you can't really market when there's civil conflicts and things like that. And even still today, we're still trying to push Ethiopia. Just some countries, it's just, you know, but, um, you know, we gave it our best uh, effort. And uh, right. I'm still not giving up on Ethiopia. I really want to work that schedule back on. But I just want to make sure that we just have a nice, smooth flow into the country. Because it's one of the more incredible countries that I've visited. And definitely uh, you know, the top top two with Egypt as far as it's historical. There's no other countries on this planet like Ethiopia and uh, Egypt. That's right. Two of the great historical countries for black people. That's right. Rashida, did you have a follow-up comment or question you wanted to share? Um, yes. What's wrong with using that semi? <laughs> Instead of buying shoes, buy a ticket. You know, do something for yourself. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, sister, that's always a great advice because uh, some of us got collections of Jordans and some of them things are not exactly cheap. And uh, that's uh, that's your plane ticket right there. Uh, but I uh, just wanted to encourage our people to make more sacrifices. And because we're not just going to Africa, we're building future enterprises that's going to take us out of just the quote unquote, uh, these uh, slave wage uh, or slave jobs to where we're enterprising and, you know, we're owning our, the future, you know, to where we're focusing more on doing the things that we need to do versus this wage hustling every day. 
All right, all right. Well, we're going to uh, um, get a final comment from you, Rashida, before we move forward. Yes, I would suggest that anyone with an idea, make your ideas include the local people so you can get the love and you can spread the love. Don't go there trying to be a colonist. Go there as a student. I am an African. Teach me how to be an African. I want to learn. That's such a beautiful and powerful thought. Absolutely. Thought. That was wonderful. All right. Greetings to you, beloved. Thanks for calling. Don't make us wait so long to hear your voice again on your LIB radio. All right. We'll be All talking right. to you. Guidance hey, and protection. Hey. I send love. Mr. Bobo, right. say hello to the audience. You want to say hello? So you remember Kitty, right? The conscious roster. Come say hello, please. Come this way. He's acting like a 13-year-old already. He's 12 years old. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Come say hello real quick. All right, all right. We're going to begin to wrap it up here in just a few minutes, Brother Bomani. I want to thank you so much for reserving his time and always keeping us in mind when you have these dynamic events happening on the mother continent. And it just keeps getting better and better. I look forward again to traveling with this collective of Africa for the Africans. Every trip has been magnificent from the time we start meeting one another at the airport in New York that we start to feel like I am part of this family and we arrive there in Ghana. I believe Ghana has a new airport. They've expanded. Their uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, that airport has been new as, as the last few years and it is incredible. As soon as you come into Ghana, you know, you're in a, a modern airport. And as soon as you step outside of the airport, it's just this beautiful city line of development. I'm telling you that when we first was going to Ghana in 2006, seven, it was, you know, it was just a different view. Uh, mm -hmm. but, but I'm telling you, family, what you have seen is development. But what we must do, we have to be a part of these development. We can't just let people right. come into our countries and just do all the development. Now, we have to also put ourselves in a position where we're learning because we can't continue to go like, you know, we can't continue just to expect anybody else to just develop our own continent because they're not just doing it for free either at the same time, too. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it's a, a game of just investments and things. So I want to see more of us uh, learn these skills and um, those of us in America that have all these wonderful skills, that's the market right there for you in Africa. Educating that's and training right. our young generation of children that we bring in, the ones that we have there in the African continent. All right. Um, we're we're going to have to wrap it up. It's uh, The time is moving forward. Oh, we have already gone over time. Yes, I just get so okay. into these conversations with you, Brother <laughs> Bumani. I just get so excited reminiscing about those great trips about the memories some of this are just priceless like being on the trip with brother just love yes. oh that was just absolutely awesome the canopy walk <laughs> always a classic canopy and that's walk, always yes. a classic we even did it in the rain one year <laughs> and uh, that absolutely. was really great so many many great memories the naming ceremony being with sister imacus at the beautiful uh, one Africa resort. Yeah, right there, right down the beach. Those are classic and, moments. You know, and of course, Africa. touring those dungeons and those enslavement ports, the, the door of no return is now a door of return. And we must go back and pass through that moment. A lot of tears. I saw grown men sobbing in those dungeons when we realized the length to which the survival in the hearts and in the bodies of our ancestors was just so strong to overcome that. I'll never forget the day of the, the several trips we tripped to the, the point of, the, of last return. What was that pool called, the little river? Um, uh, that was a sin, man. So it was the last bath of our African the ancestors. The last bath. They were taken to the dungeons. And I'll never forget that one day when we visited the last bath, one of our elder sisters <laughs> fell in the water. No, fell in the water. Now, one of the younger members of the troop started laughing, and I turned and admonished the young man, yes, don't you did. dare laugh at one of your elders having an accident and falling into a stream that had bathed our ancestors by the tens of millions before they suffered a fate that they would never. Don't you dare laugh. 
You don't have the right to laugh. You don't have the dignity for your people to laugh. I'll never forget that moment. That was a teachable moment. Absolutely. And we, have, we do have to, to you know, do these things right on the spot and educate our people because sometimes, uh, you know, like instead of filming, how about you go help the person? <laughs> yeah, yeah, people filming it. And I think I, I was the one, or I was not too far from her. I was the one that went down, put one leg in the water, grabbed her firmly and lifted her up. And the beautiful spirit that she was, she was just such a beautiful spirit on the trip too. I'll never forget that. So, so many memories that will last a lifetime. Lifetime, so Your trip to the lifetime. One more memory I got to talk about. We're on the tour bus and the question comes up about polygamy. Oh, you recall that one? That's always one of those things. <laughs> the question came up about polygamy. I'll tell this as fast as I can. And... One brother, we it, somebody asked about the circumstances in which a man could have multiple wives there in Ghana. And at the time, I knew statistically 20 percent, 26 percent of married Ghanaian women were in a multiple wife married situation. And so this question. So our guide, who was so beautifully well informed and knowledgeable, was telling us about these different circumstances in which this could happen. And one of the sisters in the back of the bus says, well, what if a woman wants to marry more than one man. And he had the most puzzled look on his face. <laughs> <laughs> he had the most puzzled look on his face and someone would ask that question. And then he, it's like his face was to say, well, why would a woman want to do that? And her response, I think, was something like, well, if a man can do it, we want to do it too. That's always the answer. That's always, That's always the answer. answer. <laughs> but then he explained to her that Women can do that in the society, but they're regarded as prostitutes. <laughs> so why would a woman who doesn't have to put herself in a situation to be socially regarded as a prostitute for having multiple men pay for her lifestyle, which is what you know women do all around the world. And so the, the sister just kind of, she was a little frustrated, but she I think she realized we are not in Kansas anymore, Toto. Yes, you are not in Kansas anymore. And Western rules do not apply. And okay. on that note, let's go ahead and wrap it up for today. Brother Bumani, for somebody who wants to stay in contact with you, how can they best do so? They can go to Africa for the Africans.org, spell it out just the way it's usually spelled. Or is there other means of contacting you to get on these trips? Uh, yes, yeah, so what I have is a nice flyer right here, family. Uh, can you let me know if you can see the flyer? Um, it's on your computer. Oh, yeah, let me put it up. Let me add that to the stream. Uh, and sure, let uh, me... As far as uh, if you can flip over to where I can see the share page. Okay. Uh, okay. So I family, don't... Can you see uh, the share page now? Yeah, you can see it now. It's uh, perfect. Uh, so, family, that's our details for our information for our Africa Tours and Investment. Our website is Africa for the Africans.org. And you can connect me or connect to me at the US number plus one four oh four nine three one nine four two nine. And then below is all of our social pages, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, uh, where we have pictures and videos of our previous tours. That way you can just uh, process all of the information. And then once you're on our website, all you have to do is click on the tour of interest. Or you can click on our investment Black Star Pan African Community link, and then that will give you a full flow of details. This is a website that's full of details. Uh, so it's something to where, you know, if you're traveling or looking to travel on a tour with us, you have access to read the uh, full itinerary overview, general terms, preparation information, and all those things are 100% there on the website before you make any commitment because we want to make sure that people are clear about the commitment that they're getting into, especially when it comes to a land investment. At Black Star Pan African Communities, a lot of information to read, and also we're available to where we can talk and go through information. But once you commit, we want people to stick with commitments because the biggest issue that I've had the last few years is with so many people committing to all different kind of things, tours, investment, and then changing their minds, and then they are not being very nice when they change their minds and things like that. Like they don't understand uh, policies. We have general terms on everything that we do. Uh, we have cancellation and refund policies and things like that. But most important, we have a lot of information and we are available to go to 
any details that anyone you want to want to, anyone want to go to. We have um, conference calls on a regular basis, and then we just have general presentations and just actively always just online on the, you know on the YouTube on the internet for over a decade and a half straight uh, and doing this business as we look to take it to another level. All right, it's going to be all good. Thank That's you good. to everyone who tuned in. Thank you to Rashida for the call. And thank you to the family for being family. So we can all move forward. We have these pathways now. The pathways have been open. Africa for the Africans.org. We also, I highlighted the website for Brother Nee, and that is Go Black 2, the number two Africa. You find that on YouTube. It's an excellent place. There's so many. There's Tayo Ainai, Aini, Aini is his name. There is Brother Wode Maya and a number of others who are doing brilliant work on YouTube. Well, but Brother Mani, you've got a brilliant YouTube website as well. So we encourage everybody, get involved, get engaged, move yeah. forward. The future okay. is ours to claim. So let's not be shy about it. Thank you, Brother Bamani, for all you brought to today's show. Thank you, family. Take care. And on that note, I'm going to wrap it up for today. It's been a good day here on LAB Radio, LAB TV, and livinginblack.com. We have been talking about repatriation, investment, travel, trade, tourism. We're talking about building collaborative partnerships, investing in people who will certainly appreciate it for generations. And Let's go home and let's reclaim our destiny. Our motherland, our mother continent has been missing us for 20 generations. This is the time that we now have set aside to be able to close that great historical void. And on that note, I am going to wrap it up for today. It's been a good day here on LAB Radio, LAB TV, and Living in Black. Tell your friends to tell their friends we have our own now. We are African people, building together with African people. And on that note, thank you very much. We're out of here for today. We'll be back with you tomorrow, same time for program we call Tech and Future Talk. You're on LAB Radio, LAB TV, livinginblack.com.